Atheists and other critics of Christianity often list biblical contradictions as one of their top objections. But does this claim hold up to scrutiny? This video is part of a collaborative series between myself and Cole from Practical Faith. Each video stands on its own, but if you're not already doing so, you may want to watch from the playlist to see them in order. Then subscribe to both our channels to make sure you don't miss any future installments of the series. Links to the playlist and Cole's channel are found in the description box of this video. In this video, I will examine the first and simplest strategy, reading the text in its original context for yourself. So stay tuned as we increase our confidence in God through better understanding His Word. In the first video, I showed how the Christian understanding of Scripture, works of men inspired by God rather than word-for-word -word dictation, means the truth of our faith is not compromised by difficulties in the Scripture, and I showed that far from causing doubt, differences in Gospel accounts allow us to objectively confirm the truth of our beliefs. With the stakes set, let's now turn to looking at some strategies for understanding the discrepancies we do find in the Bible. The first strategy, the one covered in this video, is also the simplest. Read both passages in their original context and see if a plain reading of the text causes any difficulty. If someone has to explain the contradiction, chances are high that there isn't actually anything there. Atheists like to point to long lists of alleged contradiction. The strategy is obvious. They know no one will read more than a few of the items on their list, and even fewer will look up anything. They thus fill the list with junk that no one would consider an actual contradiction in any other situation. Knowing the length of the list causes the main impact. People come along who have already decided that Christianity is false for some other reason, and are just looking for evidence to fit their view. They read a couple items, and then they are convinced of what they already believed. I've looked at some of these lists, and probably 90% of the contradictions are resolved simply by reading the texts with a little common sense. Indeed, quite often the alleged contradiction is within the same book, and not something even a simple human author would accidentally put in their texts if they are understood the way that atheists try to make them sound. For example, one such list claims that 1 Samuel 17.50 and 1751 contradict each other. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. So Goliath was killed by a stone. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Or was it a sword? If these were two lines by two different authors, we might wonder what happened. But they are literally right next to each other. No person who wasn't preset on finding a contradiction would think anything of this. Obviously, David hit Goliath with a stone, which knocked him out, and then he cut off his head to ensure that Goliath was dead which literally killed him. Who cares? Scripture is not trying to teach on the exact moment of death. Both the stone and the sword contributed to the end of Goliath, so it is legitimate to say both killed him. Here is another example. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 reads, Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness, I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Acts 7, 48-50 reads, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet said, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So which is it? Does God dwell in human-built houses or not? Simply reading all of 1 Kings 8 easily resolves the alleged problem. 
In the verses that follow the one we read, the author repeatedly says the building will be for, quote, the name of the Lord, and eventually concludes in verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. So even if we assume 1 Kings is just the work of a human being, it is obvious that the author is not actually saying God will be confined to the building, that he will literally live in it like a human being lives in a house. Rather, he is saying that the temple will be dedicated to God, and God will return the favor by blessing it with his name, that is, his character and actions. Admittedly, the objections raised in this video are not very difficult, but that's kind of my point. People who make contradiction lists often are not offering serious objections, but rather are trying to create a false perception of abundant air. The rest of the videos in this series will examine some of the more serious discrepancies. If you are watching from the playlist, the next video will start momentarily. If not, click the icon to my left or the link in the video description. Thanks for watching.